was on the island. We band during the dry season and the wet season in pulses that last about three days per station. So a typical banding pulse will usually take about a month to complete. Uh, we operate mist nets. We extract all the birds that we capture in these mist nets, place a nice little metal numbered band on their legs, and then we take a bunch and try and age, them, age and sex them as accurately as possible. Because uh, having accurate ages is what enables us to determine survival and other demographics. So here's where our stations are or have been. Not all of these are currently active, um, but this is just sort of a, an overview of where we've banded and the kinds of have on the island. Of course, all the way from Tangan Tangan Forest, which tends to lay flat like a bunch of toothpicks during a storm, <laughs> versus the uh, nice sort of dense uh, canopied native rainforest. In 11 years of banding the land birds on Saipan, we've had 14,000 roughly. Uh, these are not individual birds. Note that this also uh, includes recaptures, so birds that can get captured over and over again. Uh, and about a third of our bar are recaptures. Uh, the three most captured species in the program are bridled white eye, uh, which I believe is also called Nosa in the local uh, Rufus fantail, Nabak, and uh, golden white eye, which is Canario. And of these three, the number one most captured bird is the uh, comprising about half of those captures. I think it's 6,900 some are all rufous fantails. There's a lot of them on Saipan. And they also keep coming back, which is great. So with the uh, captures that we have, we can take a look at some demographic trends. So this is just a general summary of over the 11 years, um, but we can also look at individual events like Typhoon Sotolor. But if you summarize everything, and so this is include other species, that I didn't name on the last slide. This is Mariana Kingfisher also, which is sea heck, and Micronesian Mysomella, or the honey eater, Egigi, um, data to sort of summarize those as well. And so looking at their long-term demographics, we can track population growth rate. So for those, uh, you want a population growth rate of about one. That means the population is stable. If it's less than one, it's declining. And if it's more than one, it's increasing. And you can see here on Saipan, over the course of the last 11 years, at least for these five species, are pretty stable. There's a slight chance that Rufus fantail might be in a minor decline. At last four years, we've had some decreasing numbers. But you can see the confidence intervals are placed below. So, um, you know, below that 0.92, you have the confidence in one. So it's possible that they're okay. There's just a little bit of year-to-year -year variation. Uh, and then the honey eater uh, seems to definitely be increasing on Saipan able to take advantage of a lot of different habitats and are doing really well, so that's great. Uh, there are two big factors that contribute to population growth rate, and that's survival and recruitment. So apparent survival, again, the S in that T-maps. Um, this includes not only birds that, well, it's, it's the, the reason it's called apparent survival is there are cases where a bird might just leave a station in case we don't, we don't know if it's dead or if it left, so that's why we call it apparent survival. Um, right includes not only productivity, the young birds hatching, but also includes young birds moving to the stations from other parts of the island and staying there. So perhaps lets us look at demographic trends and we can figure out for individual species what's the most important factor in their ongoing population. You two knocked that out of the water, but we're going to talk about Sotolor today. So what happened to the birds, though? Luckily, we were able to get back out there right in time for our typical wet season mist netting pulse in September. We noticed a lot of changes to the island habitat. We're really curious to see how the birds were doing. And before we analyzed those initial results, we then continued to band for you know, another year. So the results that I'm going to be talking about cover what happened you know, on, in general years before Sotolor, what happened in the month right after Sotolor, and then what happened following, so that we could see if there was a long-term recovery or any other long-term effects. Um, there's a lot going on on this chart, so I'll try and walk you through it. This is, again, those three most commonly captured species. And so on the right, you have Rufus fantail, then golden white-eye, and then bridled white-eye. These are population estimates for each season of the years listed on the bottom. And we have a blue solid line, which is an A array of nets, and a red dashed line, which is a B array of nets. So each station has two arrays. So we can more fine scale differences between locations. Um, and then that black dashed line in each one of those uh, that goes straight vertically, Typhoon Sotolor. So for, for Rufus Fantail, we notice a couple of really obvious patterns. One is that in places where they were doing well, 
at Bird Island, Lateran Tanque, and at Objan, there was a huge population decline immediately following the storm. Um, the bird off pretty precipitously. But you'll notice in the year after that, they rebounded pretty quickly. Um, with a few exceptions, Objan, they still seemed a little bit low in population size. Uh, and there were some places like at Kingfisher, Mount Tapachau, and one of our Lateran Tanque arrays where they actually weren't affected very badly at all. It seems like a year after Typhoon Sotolor, Rufus Fantail seemed to have recovered to a pretty normal population size. Golden White Eye, similar stores affected. Um, they did seem to decline a little bit at Bird Island, but not more than they've done in previous years. Uh, again, one of our latter and Tonke around, but then they seem to sort of even out. Um, and then the other stations that we were able to band at, note that we don't really capture them at Objon, it's not really their habitat, so that's, um, but there, and then Bridled White Eye in general, seem to do okay. They didn't seem to be that affected by the storm at all. To know why, of course, and to sort of figure out some more fine details of what happened. So on the left, we have um, the emigration at the top left, so the chances that a bird will leave a mist netting station and then come back to it later. And so again, you have that dashed line representing Typhoon Sotolor. Red squares are Rufus Fantail, and the blue circle is Golden White Eye. And then on the bottom, you have the chance that they remain off the station, in which case they either left or died, we don't know. And you can see in every single year, whether it's after the storm or not, um, the chances of these things are really high. These birds move around a lot and uh, exactly where they go to, but they don't seem to stick too closely in any one particular place. So this means that those declines we saw were losses in survivorship. If they normally move around a lot and then you lose a whole bunch of them, they actually probably died. But then they did come back, thankfully. Uh, and then on the, just another um, looking at specifically Sotolor versus any other time in the program with Rufus Fantail only at these arrays, just to see if there were any to see that they did pretty strongly decline in some locations. So if Rufus Fantail declined a whole lot, but then sign after that, what happened? Well, the other part of TMAPS is productivity. And uh, Rufus Fantail had a bit of a baby boom, <laughs> which is excellent to see. There were tons and tons of little chicks that fledged right after Sotolor. So in any non-Sotolor month of the program, you can see product relatively low for a lot of these birds. A lot of them seem to survive pretty well, and they don't produce a lot of chicks in typical seasons. But right after the storm, in that immediate couple of months following it, we had a ton of Rufus Fantail chicks. We also seem to have a slight increase in golden white eye chicks, although it's non-significant because it does overlap with normal uh, sort of breeding status. Uh, so these things correspond really well to another paper that we published in 2016, which was looking specifically at productivity in dry versus wet seasons for these three species. And we saw that typically golden white eye productivity is pretty good when there's a lot of contrast between the seasons. If you have a really dry, dry season, and a really wet, wet season, then golden white eye has high productivity in those kinds of years. Rufus fantail productivity is super high when you have a ton of water. They love it. That's what they're all about. <laughs> so you have a ton of water dumped onto a place after Sotolor that survived managed to produce a ton of chicks. And then bridled white eye just, they're troopers and they just power on through everything and then <laughs> weather can do whatever it wants, they'll just do fine. All right, so, all three of these species, at least, um, the ones we captured in good enough numbers to really do these analyses on, seemed to be totally resilient to Typhoon Sotolor. Even though there may have been some decreases at one point in time, they seemed to have, or for some species, they didn't decrease at all. Rufus Fantail had a baby boom, like I said, and we think that these things are related strongly to their diet. These actually to other bird studies that have been done in the Caribbean with hurricanes on those islands. A lot of insectivorous birds, birds that eat insects, seem to be able to withstand some typhoons pretty well. Birds that eat fruit and nectar and other things that um, you know a, a typhoon can come through and rip all the flowers down and their honey eater are gonna eat. Um, luckily, they also eat some insects, but the fruit doves, we don't really know what they do in situations like this. The fantails, obligate aerial insectivores. So they need foliage to fly around and glean insects from and so when the typhoon ripped all the leaves off the trees, they struggled for a bit, but as soon as those leaves started growing back in, suddenly there was this flush of greenery, a ton of insects, and they were able to feed all that to their chicks and have a ton of young birds. And golden white eyes are really good at eating um, 
arthropods that live on the ground. And so the typhoon knocked a bunch of branches down, provides all this benthic arthropods, and then those birds were able to eat them. We also encountered a new hypothesis that we'd like to look into in more depth, and it sounds like some habitat work is being done, habitat data we'd like to analyze for our stations. It looks like the native limestone rainforest trees were more resilient to the storm also than some of the introduced species. Like I mentioned tangan tangan, it tends to snap, get uprooted, just completely get laid flat in these storms. And monkey pod also seems to struggle. You saw that one real slide that had been knocked over completely. Um, so it might be that native trees provide refuge for the native birds, but we have to look into that in more depth. Uh, we still don't really know fully how other species were affected. Um, we're going to have to see if there's other things we can do, like some radio telemetry maybe, some target netting to see what happens to those birds in these situations. Now, of course, in the future, storm intensity is predicted to increase. We're going to have worse typhoons, more we already know. I just talked about Sotalor, but this is a picture of you two. So we know that they do get worse and they do get more you know, frequent. And these birds, many of them, else. so it's really important to understand what's happening to them each time one of these storms hits. They're already struggling with having to you know, live through development, and there's the risk that the brown tree snake could appear here at any time. So it's really important to continue to monitor them um, for whatever may come in the future. Uh, so I'd like to thank all of you for coming and talking to me. I think I have a couple minutes for questions. Um, I was really curious if you have an idea why the contrast in greenness between dry and would affect the productivity of, was it the golden white eye? Yeah, it was golden white eye. I would have to go back and read that paper again. It's been a few years <laughs> since I've looked at it. Um, there must be something to do with their diet flexibility. Maybe the high contrast improves the chance of fruiting in some species that they rely on. Uh, there's probably a lot of things going on. We know that they are pretty flexible in their diets, and so there must be something that they're able to capitalize on when the weather changes like that, but I don't know for sure. Right. Let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> And uh, Steve Mullen is back for a talk about the um, CNMI's Avian Translocation Program. All right, sorry, you're going to have to listen to me again. <laughs> All right, and you know who I am. So I'll be talking about the establishing uh, species resilience on small islands, and more particularly, CNMI's avian translocation program. So I'm pretty sure most of you here have a pretty good idea of the brown tree snake issue that the Marianas has. I'll just talk about it pretty quickly, though. The tree snake is native to North Australia, New Guinea, and parts of Indonesia. Uh, it most likely arrived in southern Guam in 1950 as a stowaway on military equipment ships. Um, and by 1988, uh, it was responsible for the uh, extirpation or extinction of 9 out of 12 native bird species on Guam. So Guam's only 80 kilometers away from Rota and about 180 kilometers away from Saipan. There's a lot of traffic going on between those islands, a lot of boats lost. Um, and if the brown tree snake was ever to get a, a hold onto the southern islands of the CNMI, there'd be 14 native bird species that would be in jeopardy, as well as a whole host of other species. And this is something we're not really interested in seeing happen. So back in 2005, there was a, a meeting between the CNMI Division of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and a nonprofit called Pacific Bird Conservation. These guys are out of Hawaii. These guys had a, a pretty long brainstorming session and what came out of this session was they decided to proceed with conservation introductions of native species from the southern islands of Saipan, Tinian, and Rota to the most islands of the northern CNMI. And from this they developed the Marianas AB Fauna Conservation Plan or the MAC plan. And this plan was to produce one or two redundant populations in areas that would be 
far removed from areas that would be uh, affected by brown tree snakes if they were ever to get a hold here down in the southern islands. Um, but how important this partnership is, it's, it's a true partnership. Uh, all three organizations play a, a, a very important role here and they have uh, functions that they play. And if any one of them were to step away from the table, this program would most likely fall apart. So what are the Pacific Bird Conservation? What do these guys do? Well, they bring in a whole bunch of highly trained zoologists and veterinarians, highly trained in um, animal welfare, animal husbandry. They come here and they help us capture the birds. They take care of the bird activity, so they take care of most of the feeding and that type of thing. They do a full health assessment on all the birds so that we're only translocating healthy um, without diseases. And then on top of this, they do a whole bunch of outreach and education here. They go to a bunch of the schools on the islands. They talk to the students, the teachers, and get the good word out. Folks at the CNMI, well, we take care of all of the planning and the scheduling for the annual translocations. Uh, we set up all the transportation. So uh, depending on what's available, we'll take a boat, we'll take a helicopter. And of course, it depends on how far the target is. And then we do all of the pre- and post-translocation surveys as well. So before we introduce any birds to any of the islands, we go up there and we do a full island-wide set of surveys where we're looking at birds, mammals, reptiles, ve vegetation, uh, invertebrates, pretty much everything. The schedule typically a year before we do a translocation. And then, of course, we want to see how well the translocations are doing. So we'll run a set of post transplant surveys as well. And typically, these are, uh, will be done about five years after the first phase of a translocation to the particular target island. And the third group here is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Again, they provide an awful lot of funding for this project and offer a, a, a bunch of technical guidance when needed. So since you guys are all here, I'm assuming you know where the CNMI is, but um, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you'll see these, all these red dots over there. Those are the, the 14 islands of the CNMI. A little closer look here. The southern islands of Saipan, Tin, the bottom, those are the source populations of the birds. And if you move a little bit further north, you'll see Surigan, Guguan, Alamagan. Those three islands have already had since taken place there. And then even further north, Pagan, Agrihan, and Assumption, those are future target islands. So, so far, we've translocated five species to three islands. So here we got Golden white eye, Marion's fruit dove, Rufus fantail, Tinian monarch, and bridal white eyes. And these five species came from either Saipan or Tinian. The goal here is to release these birds onto at least two target islands so that we have hopefully two redundant pots. And at the same time, we don't want to be releasing birds that don't coexist in nature onto the same island. So, for example, Golden white eye and Tinian monarch, you won't see them. the monarchs only on Tinian golden white eye on Saipan and a Giguan. So, of course, we don't want to re release them on the same island. So, if you look at the complete translocation schedule that we've set up, I mean, this, this is not concrete. This changes almost every year. It's a pretty robust program. Started back in 2008 when we started bringing bridal white eyes up to Surigan. And we've got translocations scheduled all the way out to tour. So, quite a few years of translocations in store left. And one thing, I, I didn't even realize this, I guess, but I was looking at the schedule a few days ago and noticed it, we're at the halfway point, and that's pretty exciting. Um, so after 2020, we'll have all the translocations to Regan, Guguan, and Alamagan. So that'll pretty much be uh, completed on those, three, on those three islands, except for the, you know, the continuation of the monitoring. Uh, next, we plan on moving to translocating three listed species, the Mariana Swiftlet, the Rota White Eye and the Reed Warbler. And again, I, from, the, from the map I showed there, there's, there's four additional Northern Islands that would like to release birds on. So I'm gonna start talking about Surigan first and what happened here. So we had uh, translocations taking place between 2014. In 2012, they did an initial set of post-translocation -translo surveys, mostly looking at the bridal White Eye. Um, it was, a, it, it was a small set, but they kind of wanted to have a, a quick idea of what was going on. They, they ran 24-point counts along three, 
street transects, collected that data, brought it back. And then in June of 2016, we ran the full assessment of, of the post-translocation survey. So we were looking at all four species. This time we did 48 point counts along five transects. Again, collected all that data, brought it back, and then we analyzed it in our studio using the distance package. And we find out, well, looked like the birds were doing pretty well. So 2012, about 3,000 birds were estimated, and then in seen just about 7,000 birds. And a really important number to look at if number of birds released. So we released 100 bridal white eyes up on, and these guys did all the hard work for us. The other three species look uh, pretty good as well. Golden white eye, estimated about 1,800, 200 fruit dove, and about 2,400 of the rufous fantail. Again, you can see the, the number were, were less than 100. So moving on to Guguan, we've completed three out of the four phases of trans. The goal here is to release about 100 Tinian monarchs, bridal white eyes, and rufous fantails, and about 50 of the, the Marianas. Next year will be the fourth phase, and Guguan will be essentially completed translocation-wise. Post-translocation surveys will, will be conducted next year as well, and we'll have an idea of what's going on there. But we do have some pretty good observational data. So in 2016, when we released some birds up there, we are doing some, uh, some surveys. Well, we, we were able to observe 20 of the 100 Tinia monarchs that were released. And because we were only surveying in about 20 to 25 percent of forest habitat, to me that looks like it, the survival was, was looking pretty good of the released birds. We saw three unbanded, so evidence of breeding going on there. We had a pair of birds uh, building a nest as well, so obviously these guys are doing what they need to do. Uh, bridal white eyes we had detections, but we did detect eight flying over. Uh, again, we weren't able to see if they were banded or not, so we don't really have a, a, a real good idea on if it's occurring there yet, but hopefully next year. On Alamagan, uh, we had two phases, uh, last year and this year. Again, we had about 100 golden white eyes and 100 uh, rufous fantails that were released up there. Some minimal observational surveys while up there and we're able to find some unbanded golden white eyes. So again, some evidence of breeding Gamagan. So the, of course, the big question is, uh, are the translocation successful or not? And so you can look at, look at this at different ways. Was one would be, did the release uh, go according to plan? Uh, number two would be, how well the populations are, are doing on those target islands. And three would be, did we mess anything up? Did we, you know, one of these populations, make sure that everything that was there before is not being affected? So looking at Sarigan first, it's successful so far. All the, all the translocations went according to plan. Uh, bird populations look like they're doing pretty well. We'll be planning another set of surveys up there at some point in the future to really get an understanding of how everything's doing, make sure nothing's going on that we don't want to happen. Guguan, it's a little too soon to tell, but uh, definitely promising. Uh, we're able to get those observations of unbanded birds, so we know that they're doing what they need to up there. And Alamagan is just a little bit too early to tell, really. We, we, we did the two sets of translocations. We won't be getting up there until maybe 20 to before we have some really concrete information there. So a lot of people to thank. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, funded the project uh, immensely through Wildlife Restoration Grants, Director of DFW, Manny Pangolin, and Pacific Bird Conservation, particularly Herb Roberts, uh, entire staff of CNMI Wildlife Section, both, both past and present, and Association of Zoos of Aquariums. So. Was I that short? <laughs> 2008, yeah. So about 12. Nope. Well, again, this was before my time, but again, this, um, this was looked at 
back in 2005 with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with CNMI Division of Fish and Wildlife and that nonprofit organization that was brought in. Uh, this was discussions back then. Um, I'm not 100% sure what happened in those closed door discussions, which really weren't closed door, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure they've, they've had several discussions with everything that was going on up there. So Steve, just curious, have you noticed impacts or declines in the original native birds on these islands from your surveys? Yeah, no, we, we went along and collected that same data, Regan, and there, there weren't any declines. Okay, thanks. And now we have uh, Aaron Darrington, who is going to um, talk to us about a coastal resilience assessment tool um, for. Here you go, Aaron. Thank you. I didn't figure the plug was on the wrong side. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you again to our conference organizers for uh, us to present. My name is Aaron Darrington, and I'm with the Office of Planning and Development. But I'm here today as a member of the Marianas Mappers group. And so with our partners, um, local and federal partners, who you'll be hearing from today, uh, to develop an exciting new tool to help identify resiliency in Marianas. So the Office of Planning and Development is an advisory council member in this process, along with many of our federal and state um, partners today. Our focus really is on using data to support comprehensive, sustainable development now and for the future. Um, and so it's in uh, that we are supporting the development of this tool and data collection with uh, NEMAC, which is the National Environmental Modeling and Analysis Center, uh, and some federal and local partners who you'll hear from today. Uh, so with that, I would like to use this opportunity to share that this tool is in development here in CNMI. I wanted to share out with some of the experts in the field uh, to invite you to share your data and input as we develop this tool for the Marianas. And we're holding a workshop tomorrow at Hyatt. I do know that it conflicts with several of the, uh, the field trips. I apologize for that. But the workshop will be at 8 a.m. Um, at the Chapman. And you can definitely contact me or Greg, who you'll be hearing from shortly, uh, if you have more information or would like to hear more and join uh, in ongoing Converse tool development as we move forward. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to Greg Dobson, uh, who is going to be walking you through the co-assessment process uh, that is underway here for the Marianas. Greg serves as the director of geospatial technology and is a research scientist with the University of Asheville's NEMAC National Environmental Modeling and Analysis Center. For over a decade, Greg has been responsible for applying cutting edge GIS and geospatial based climate change, community resilience, coastal flooding, and land use change patterns. NEMAC has worked directly with NOAA to provide um, assistance to the development of the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit as well as to support the U.S. Uh, global change research programs um, uh, website and, and research uh, resources and support the fourth national climate assessment and subsequent reports. More recently, NEMAC with NIFWIT, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and NOAA to create this coastal resilience assessment tool for coastal communities in the United States. And Greg, with that, I will turn the mic over to you. Do you want to try us now? One moment, please. Oh, thank you. Sorry, good now? Yes, can you hear me now? I believe we can. Can you folks hear out there if he says something? Up and down? Uh, Hello? A little up. Uh, I'm maxed out. Up. All right. I'm going to be standing with you with the microphone. Okay, and all my slides coming across okay? Yep, we can see your slides. We're working on the volume, Great. you guys. Okay. Uh, go right ahead. Okay. 
Uh, well, thanks, Aaron, for the introduction uh, to the uh, to the project, to the assessment that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, good morning, everyone there in the room. Thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to present remotely all the way from North Carolina, where it is still Monday night. Uh, but we're very, uh, very excited to uh, have this uh, opportunity to talk to you about this very exciting project as Aaron was describing. So, yeah, we've been with with uh, NIFWIF, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, and, and NOAA for uh, going on four years now in building out what's the uh, Coastal Resilience Assessment for the United States. And there we go. Um, one of the key objectives in building out the assessment is to help uh, organizations like NIFWIF and NOAA and other uh, partners such as those of you all in the uh, identify areas on the landscape where conservation actions or restoration projects, resilience projects can have dual benefit of not only increasing the resilience of natural resource communities but also increasing the resilience of human communities as well. So that's one of this assessment really different from uh, you know, traditional assessments that maybe just focus on natural resources or maybe they just focus on community. Here we really want to have that dual of, of objective uh, or that dual benefit of, um, uh, of being able to increase both. And so I'm going to walk you through kind of some of our methodology that the graphic there on the screen is highlighting and, and the different pieces that, that go into to building a coastal resilience assessment. So, like I said, we've been at this for about four years now, and just this past spring, we completed of the assessment, which is everything that you see in green there on the map. Basically, the, the whole continental U.S. coastline, with the exception of the Great Lakes, has now completed. Uh, you'll notice the boundary, too, there. I'll, I'll point that out. We, uh, the, the boundary of this assessment, uh, of this coastal assessment, was the, uh, the USGS Huck 8 watershed boundaries, the, the coastal designated watershed boundaries. So that's another thing that makes this assessment different from assessments. Instead of focusing just on that narrow ribbon of coastline, you know, we really wanted to take this you know, inland and, and, consi and consider the whole uh, coastal uh, environment, if you will, that uh, uh, these watersheds that, again, that are draining you know, to the coastline. So that becomes important to point out when we get to, for instance, uh, a region like CNMI. You know, again, we're not going to focus just on the coast. We'll, we'll, we'll cover the entire CNMI. So again, phase one there in green, we are now underway with phase two which does include CNMI as well as Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and I ask, well, why not? I uh, see Guam and American Samoa there. Why not do CNMI at the same time you do uh, Guam and Samoa? And basically, it ends with the impacts of uh, Typhoon U2 last year. And given the fact that there is now resilience funding through the, uh, through the emergency fund, we wanted to be able to get this going as quickly as possible so that you guys will have this as a resource to use in your planning efforts there. So if you are, or if anyone in the room happens to be from American Samoa as well, uh, stay tuned. We will be um, kicking off assessments for your regions um, in 2020, hope in the March, April timeframe. So just to kind of quickly step you through the methodology of, of how we've gone about putting this together, we basically have three key parts, we have, and the first of which is what we call our community exposure index. And so we really, really want to understand where on the landscape those natural resources and community assets are exposed to a wide variety of events. And so uh, we have then kind of a sub-index uh, in here that we call our threat index. And basically we're pulling together a lot of blood-related information including some of the common themes like storm surge, sea level rise, floodplain areas, but we also look at heuristics, we look at slope, you know, areas that are likely to collect water during heavy precipitation events. We consider, we even consider geologic stressors such as, uh, you know, cliff failures can be a, an important aspect in certain parts of the coastline, uh, as well as, uh, you know, land some sorts of things. And so we add all these different inputs together. We're doing all of this, by the way, in a, in a geospatial framework. And so we add all these different, inputs, and that gives us what we call our threat index, where areas that you see in darker red there at the bottom uh, of the screen are simply, there's a higher presence of those coastal flood-related threats at that particular location. 
Now, one of the things that we you know, are, are already, you know, talk to our advisory committee, and, and one of the things that we certainly want to talk more about in the workshop tomorrow is, you know, are these the right data sets? Is there additional inputs that we need or alternate inputs that we need, can, need to consider? Yes, this was developed for the continental U.S., but we want to make it a very applicable to these new regions in mind. So this will be a, a common thing, that, a common theme that I will repeat uh, a couple of more times in the presentation. So the second part of our community exposure analysis then is looking at uh, key communities. And so again, it's that dual benefit of you know not only protecting the natural resources, you know the aquatic and terrestrial, for instance, but also that the human well. But we can't necessarily take into account all aspects of you know the human community. And so you know NIFWA have had a desire to really focus in on critical community assets that a community would need to get back up and going following a major event such as a typhoon. And so we're looking at things like critical facility infrastructure, you know, your water uh, plants, your power plants, um, you know, you know, assets such as those. And then they also consider areas of dense population as well as social vulnerability. We add all these things together, again, similar to our, our previous, in, and this gives us what we call our community asset index. And, and here, areas in darker blue are simply indicating that there's a higher presence of these community assets at that location. To then take our, our two kind of sub-indices, our threat index, in our asset index, we add these, and this gives us one of our main inputs then that I spoke about a few minutes ago, and that's our community exposure index. And so this map on the right uh, here, areas are indicating that there is a high presence of coastal flood threats uh, intersecting uh, a high presence of sets as well. So the next piece is our, uh, what we call our natural resource index, where we're at aquatic and terrestrial uh, components and, and other you know, uh, natural resource pieces as well. And so um, we consider sort of a range of different aquatic and, and terrestrial species. We, we look at a lot of the NOAA data that's available for looking at fish habitat, for instance, areas of particular concern, critical habitat. On the terrestrial side, we also incorporate bird life, uh, bird areas as well. We also are able to use uh, the NatureServe database. If you're familiar with NatureServe, a spinoff out of, of the Nature Conservancy, they maintain a rich database, uh, kind of huck level species richness data that we were able to use for the continental U.S. And we take these and, and similarly add them together. And so at, at a watershed scale, it is an indication of where. Uh, on the landscape we're seeing a higher or lower presence of these natural resources. The final component then is to take, um, is to consider then where on the landscape are areas that would be suitable for doing projects. So we start to consider, you know, where are the protected areas, where are the open space areas. We're looking at, you know, for instance, that USG areas database that has all your state, federal, and local lands, for instance. And uh, you know, open space areas that we pull out of some of the land cover data, so we can understand pre-existing. And then what we do with our community exposure index and our natural resource index is we run a series of zonal statistics on that with our different open spaces to get what our output is that we call our resilience hub. So this is kind of the one of the main products coming out of it. In is um, hubs, you know, or areas that would be. Uh, potential suitable locations for doing projects. And so this, you know, is something that NIFWIC to look at, you know, as proposals are submitted, um, or, or as we start to think about where might be a good place to, to do projects, we can use these hubs as an indication. Not that it's not the only criteria, there are many other, you know, criteria that's considered, but, you know, this begins to be this tool that we can look at for, you know, where uh, projects may have, you know, maximum benefit on the landscape. One of the ways we're disinformation is through a, uh, a tool that we've built that Aaron alluded to. It's called the Coastal Resilience Evaluation and Siting Tool. So we very much wanted to not just have a org coming out of the assessment, but a, uh, a way that would allow stakeholders and uh, such as yourselves to be able to interact with the data in a web environment. And so we've built an interactive web mapping tool that um, it basically you know, houses all of the data that goes into it. So 
Uh, this is just a screenshot from the tool. I didn't want to try a live uh, demo, although we are going to do a live demonstration of it at the workshop tomorrow. You know, here you, you can come to the to the mapping tool. It's got all the different. You know, one of the things you can do is just you know zoom in to your you know area of interest, start to toggle the different layers on and off. But there's some analysis you can do with this tool as well. For instance, if you were interested in, in a particular location for a project site, actually draw an area on the map or upload a shape file, for instance. And this is going to give you some statistics over here that talks about the amount of uh, assets, the amount of community exposure, or what the Resilience Hub makeup looks like there. So there's some different types of analyses that you can do with the tool. And again, if you're able to attend the <laughs> workshop, I'll go through this. Um, so and Greg, we just, uh, <clears throat> Greg, sorry to interrupt, but we did get, we did just get our stop uh, warning, so that's a great time okay. to give us the yes. final plug for the workshop here. Yep, that was the last slide, <laughs> is that we've got, that Aaron already mentioned, going tomorrow uh, next door at the Hyatt. And uh, this will be a great chance for you guys to come and review some of the draft models that we already have in MI, and not just uh, Saipan that you see there on the screen, but Rhoda and Tinian as well very much interested in hearing feedback on the data, uh, all you can use, and um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely uh, show how that you all as stakeholders can begin to use this for your own local planning. And with that, I'll... Great, thank you so much, and thank you to our partners. Um, again, this is supported by uh, NEMAC and NIFWIF and NOAA, and uh, please do reach out to me or to Greg if you need information, and especially if you're not able to join the workshop tomorrow. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has a question while we're switching over, ask a quick question. Well, you can ask questions tomorrow morning at the workshop as well. And I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Um, this is Michael Lanzone, uh, who will be telling us about high-resolution tracking of small organisms. Thanks. So. So we all know how crucial it is to be able to understand the complex relationships between biological and properly manage them. And working on complex issues like brown tree snake, you quickly realize it's the fine details that are so critical. It's re really important to be able to quickly react to management issues that affect our ability to manage and conserve island ecosystems and tailor our efforts to nurse ma managers and scientists in our efforts to study the effects of responses of brown tree snakes on island e ecosystems. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about a system we're hopeful that could help us fulfill, fulfill this goal. And there's a lot to kind of go over, so I'm, I know I'm going to be moving pretty quickly, but I'm going to be uh, all week or all week here so I can talk to you more about it. I'm going to start with the tags that, that work with this system. And there's a couple different types of tags. Uh, the first type is life tag and the second is power tag and the and the biggest difference between them is is one is solar power to have um, and the second has a battery works like traditional um, radio telemetry uh, but the common things be between them are they're both four third um, and which which basically is it's a UHF frequency um, so uh, the tag can operate very efficiently because of the smaller and um, it can operate at almost uh, ninety percent efficiency whereas some of the the lower VHF frequencies are, are much less uh, efficient. Um, it has much longer range um, as compared to uh, the lower frequency tags, and that's partly to do with the, with the uh, efficiency. Um, and it has unlimited frequencies, um, you, know, or, you know, roughly around 4 billion frequencies, um, which is a, a, a huge plus. Another big plus is that you can scan all frequencies at once. You don't have to cycle between frequencies, you just listen and you can simultaneously hear all the different frequencies. These tags can be made into lots and lots of different form factors and we've had them on all different types of species. Um, on the upper, upper uh, right of the screen there, upper tag for seals and there's polar bear tags there, there's leg bands, snake bands, rat tags, I mean all, all different types of... Uh, uh, so the nice thing is you can make them into any form factor, um, especially the life tags which you know, the benefit to them is they essentially work forever, being able to make a very, very small tag um, and make that into a form factor that can be worn for a very long time uh, uh, is, is a... Uh, one of the things with life tags, um, we've been trying to continually improve on the efficiency and 
Um, one of those ways, the original or the life tag that's being used now is uh, the one on the left there. Um, and I guess I don't have a pointer, but um, on the right of the design tag. And uh, being able to efficiently place this on an animal, moving it up and down to get the most, uh, you know, solar um, is important. And, and so the design has about twice the amount of solar area, and the tag is about 22% smaller than, than the previous design, which is important because it's to be as small as possible. So this is just an example of a lot of different species that have these tags on them um, and, uh, and the different sizes, small, small animals. The top left there is, I think, it's the smallest species we've had uh, a tag on so far. It's, it's a, a white-footed mouse. So this is the brains of the system. It's, it's a sensor station. So this is essentially the base station. And you know, this you know, can inter integrate really seamlessly a lot of different projects at the same time. And that's the important thing, is that if you're studying one species, but you have 20 other collaborators that are studying, they can all put tags on their animals. They can all talk to the same base station. They can record all the data simultaneously. Um, the other nice thing about it is it has real-time kind of, which means you can pick up your phone and look to see what animals are connecting. You can power it up in the morning and see pretty much anything you want to see in, in near real time. Um, you being able to add different uh, radios to this system or adding other things like cameras or you know pretty much whatever you want to. Um, you know, with all parts, um, it comes with, with five radios um, uh, standard, which uh, is around 434. Um, but this is a system that's kind of future-proof. So, Basically, as new frequencies um, come on, online, and there will be more frequencies as the tags get smaller, you know, this can essentially be updated over the air, um, and in real time, uh, you know, kind of take in a lot of other um, data as well. You know, the future direction of a lot of this stuff um, to take other types of data. So a typical life tag could send things like altitude data, uh, GPS data, um, uh, and other environmental data. So it just doesn't have to be on birds. You could have sensors in the environment that are also sending data to this um, in, in real time. The other part of this system is nodes. Um, and I'm going to talk a, a lot more about this in a minute here. But the basic thing is they're basically miniature base stations. And, and I do have some of these with me here if you want to see some of them later. Um, but they basically listen for, for time information. And, and then transfer all that data to the base station, which then aggregates all the data. And a complete system, so this is, um, you know, kind of different pieces to it. Um, it kind of creates, you know, the autonomous setup. Um, and yeah, you can still hand track, um, as in the bottom right there. Um, and it actually connects live to your phone. Um, and so you're able to see all your own in real time um, as well. But um, being able to set this up autonomously allows for 24-7 of tracking, so you know exactly where your animals are all the time. And you know, imagine just waking up in the morning, being able to open up your laptop and know that you know a Sally got eaten last night by a snake, and it's exactly in this tree. And let's go out and look for it. Not like, okay, let's go try to find some snakes that maybe and drive around and look for um, that. You can do this in real time and uh, pulling up the data and, uh, and doing that. And that kind of, a lot of applications that, that we're, you know, we're real-time data and getting that is important. Here's an example of, of some, um, one of the other nice things about this is 434 megahertz um, has about a third the size of an antennas, um, which is really important, especially when you're talking able to secure them in high winds, um, you, know, you know, typhoons or or other situations where you have uh, inclement weather, reducing the, the, wind, the, the wind loading is important. Um, and you'll see the Yagis um, on the outside here, um, like up here. Top of that, there is an omnidirectional antenna. And typically, that's used for picking up the nodes, and the Yagis um, can act to pick up you know, birds, uh, the, the actual real tag data, um, and the com combination of which uh, it kind of creates the whole the whole tracking. Uh, this is just uh, an example of of a station that is in the middle of nowhere with with no access to power. Um, but there's lots of different ways you could set this up, and you know, so a center station kind of placed out um, by itself. Um, you know, essentially, if you just had two two yagis, typically it's set up with a lot more than this. But full of of this, 
you have uh, birds that are moving through or, uh, or other animals. And, you know, just having those without any, it's going to basically get presence, absence, and direction. When you add in nodes to that system, you can then have a pattern. It can be, um, it can be you know, in a grid like this, 200 meters, 100 meters, 400 meters, depending on the habitat. It doesn't necessarily have to be an exact grid. When that happens, the node then creates an area of detection. And so basically, if you just have one, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot about, I mean, it could a bit, like if you're creating a fence or something like that, but you're basically, you're just gonna know how close it is to that antenna. But when you have a grid, you add in the detection uh, radius for all of those, and then you have your, your animals that are moving into that grid, you have simultaneous detections which are sent in real time station. And then you can see, in addition to where that animal is, um, as the animal moves through the grid, it will get in real time. And so with this, you, you're getting presence, absence, direction, and localization. And you know, different study designs, um, but, you know, kind of the bottom right here, this was actually set up for, um, and they went all out. They wanted to have all these nodes and everything else. It was kind of a crazy setup, and logistically, it was very challenging uh, because it's swamp, pretty much, um, and they ended up going with a, a, a setup like, like that, which reduced the overall uh, um, um, down to about uh, seven meters uh, for the snakes but it was really adequate for what they were looking for. Larger setup where you might have lots of, of different sensor stations set up, you can actually move the, this grid anywhere you want, add new grids at any time, um, higher resolution grids in part of the study area, not others, there's a lot of flexibility for, for, for how you can do that. And so, um, you know, that's just, you know, and, you know, the output you get is, you know, very high resolution data um, these are just a couple of uh, one-minute aggregated uh, data sets um, looking at uh, uh, movement for a couple of their different species, uh, kangaroo rats and yellow rump warblers. Uh, here's a data set. There was nothing known about, you know, where baby terrapins went after release. They, they raised all these um, from essentially a, released them, they disappeared, and they had no idea where they went. So this is the first home range data for for baby terrapins, um, and uh, these, this is a species in the U.S., and so just an application of, of how this can be used when otherwise, you know, species like this disappear. Uh, so this is uh, right near my house in Cape May, New Jersey. Uh, we were very interested in, in looking at uh, differences in, in native habitat versus there's introduced uh, uh, vegetation that's taking over, and this is the migratory bird area, so knowing how much spending and, and manipulated vegetation that um, is still native was important. So this is one day in the life of a yellow rump warbler. Um, and so um, data like, like this is very critical for being able to manage that. Uh, this is just a, a one month from, uh, from a kangaroo rat and showing that, you know, similar kind of, kind of data, but just this, you know, Kangaroo rats over, over that period um, had a, a 518,000 data points. This is a study down at Archibald Biological Station. And really the, the important thing here is, you know, when you start getting these tags out on a lot of different animals, um, you can really start to see interactions that otherwise. And, you know, the really cool thing about this was they were really interested to, to not only know, you know, kind of territorial boundaries, um, and, and one of the cool things, um, they actually had a map from, you know, um, this is a 50-year project, and so they had a map of color uh, marked individuals um, that they up here, and to compare that, and, th and these are subadult birds, compare that with this was actually striking how similar it was, but one of the cool things was they were able to, to, to have actions um, within those zones. And, the real-time data, like in the middle there, showed an aggregation of these subadults that were kind of, you know, in the other territories, and they were able to actually go and see like three, four birds together going around, doing some inter interactions, and then kind of going back to their territories. So we're really excited to apply this on Guam and on Anderson Air Force, um, you know, looking at spatial inter interactions between brown tree snakes and Sally. And remember, since this is an automated system, it's recording data can so 
you know, it's a huge advantage over just getting the periodic data from, you know, handheld uh, telemetry or even GPS data where you're very limited to a small number of points, um, you know, over a limited period um, and being, you know, having to recapture the animal. Um, and since you can use the existing infrastructure, um, you know, for species, um, you know, that's going to really help, uh, you know, our, our, our efforts to work together and, you know, kind of, you know, use limited funding we have to, to, towards the maximum benefit. Uh, you know, uh, the, you know, potential moving forward, you know, uh, you know, like secretive species like, like Guam rail that you release are kind of like the terrapins. You release them, they disappear. Um, you know, but, you know, having a system in place that you can really look in detail at what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, and also things like snakes. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we know a lot more about what big snakes are doing because you can put a GPS, you know, on a big snake and release it. But unfortunately, big snakes don't move very far, apparently. They just go between trees. And I don't know if that's always true, but people can, can potentially study the entire um, age structure of brown tree snakes. And able, I mean, and that's really important for knowing how they're moving it to be able to properly manage them and so anyway I'm really excited and hope you guys are too um, I'm excited to be here and um, have questions but I'll also be here and I have equipment here if anyone wants to see it so thanks very much Right. So you said that there's like a, a four meter accuracy for that kangaroo area. Do you have some sort of calculation to work out how many nodes you need to have to get within, say, 10 meters? Or is there, what is it for each node system? Right. So it differs by a lot about by habitat type and, and everything. But generally speaking, you know, is going to give you the, you know, the highest spatial accuracy. And that could be an, anywhere from two to three meters. Um, but you can spread that out, and, and like that in Archibald, they said, well, 200 meters, we thought we would get, you know, five to eight meter accuracy, but that'd be just because of the habitat there, instead of just being picked up on five or six nodes, it was one verb is picked up simultaneously on anywhere between 10 and 14 nodes. So um, we actually got very, very good spatial resolution in that system as well. So in the habitat, um, but yeah, we have calculations that we can use to try to help with that. Awesome. I think you asked about cost too, and maybe you guys can talk about cost afterwards. Um, but the I, just a quick answer because I know earlier it's like a hundred dollars ish, four hundred dollars a sensor station, and a couple hundred dollars a tag as a is what our Solly uh, Anderson project is. So kind of ballpark, but I'm sure he isn't that. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Um, uh, that is. Um, talking about the role of birds on arthropod communities. And um, this is Geraldine, uh, Geraldine, um, Geraldine Calor, who's a grad student in my lab. So I, um, and um, she's from Guam, and she's in her second year of her PhD. And so right now we're in the speed talk section. There'll be seven minute talks, switch talks, but no questions. And then at the end, we'll be able to ask questions of all the speakers. Um, hopefully this will keep you all energized before lunch. Uh, let's see, Geraldine, do you want to um, see if we can hear you? Yeah, can you all hear me? Can you hear in the back? Kind of. Uh, if you can maybe uh, move closer to your phone. Yeah, there you go. Like, uh, will this work? It's better. OK, cool. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Geraldine Killa Orr. As Haldra mentioned, I'm a PhD student at Iowa State University. And today I'll be talking about my dissertation research that will birds on arthropod communities. So I was born and raised on Guam. And growing up on Guam, we learned about in grade school. I remember sitting in Senora Blanco's class when she told the story about the birds. I also remember being very confused because seeing little brown birds before entering the classroom. It wasn't until years later that I realized um, what she fully meant and that those little brown birds were the non-native Eurasian tree sparrows. And this story and many others stirred my curiosity. And my experiences along the way led me to formal research trying to understand what bird loss might mean um, for my home. And that led me to work with Haldra. And so I'm interested in the role of birds as top predators. 
And birds are important top predators in many systems. Um, and as top predators, they're the role of um, shaping the community and um, maintaining their prey populations. In terrestrial systems, this often is arthropods. And arthropods, in turn, have very important interactions with plants. So birds can indirectly affect the plant community through their on the arthropod community. So consequently, bird loss might lead to these cascading effects to the plant level. And the Ecology of Bird Project has begun to explore these dynamics. And what we see is that when looking at um, seedling survival, um, we have much differences in Guam, um, in seedling survival on Guam versus that on um, the islands with birds. And we see similar results when looking at exposure experiments um, using bird netting to exclude birds. So we're not really seeing differences in seedling survival, but we have differences in the spiders. So here we're seeing that um, on Guam, we have more abundant spider webs that lack seasonality when compared to the other islands. And so this might mean that um, spiders could be forming this partial buffer um, to the effects of bird loss from that level. And so my dissertation research kind of hones in on this dynamic by um, exploring this black box here, looking at um, the interaction between arthropods. Um, and that's driven by these two questions of, first, how to alter the arthropod community? And second, what is the role of these predators in the absence of top predators? And so we'll focus first on this first question here, which can be broken down into two components, um, looking at community assemblage and then also looking at um, arthropod diets. To answer this, um, we collected um, arthropod samples um, across the islands this past summer um, using um, by setting sets. And along the points, we had sampled both vegetation and ground arthropods. Uh, for vegetation sampling, we used um, the vegetation and collected whatever arthropods fell within the sheet. Um, we also collected leaf samples for all of the vegetations that all of the vegetation we actually ended up sampling. Um, and then we also had ground sampling where we used a meter squared quadrat and cut leaf litter that fell within this quadrat um, and then sifted them in leaf, um, leaf sifters as seen here and then further into these holes um, for 48 hours. And these um, samples are now being processed here at Iowa. Um, and we're going to be using these meta barcoding methods, um, which involves um, isolating DNA and amplifying it, um, and then processing or then through sequencers to get these um, OTUs um, that can then be referenced and help us to um, understand these community assemblages. And so to get at the first part of the first question, um, we'll be just um, using metabarcoding techniques on bulk. And to get at gut content analysis, we'll be sorting out the predators and um, then isolating their abdomen, and their abdomen will be to create these predator-prey networks. Um, I'll be going to Germany in January to learn these methods from collaborators we have there. I'm hoping to get some very exciting results in the coming year. And to get at the second question of the role of music predators in the absence of top predators, we, pilot, we piloted a spider manipulation experiment on the moon. And um, so we had these forest plots that we divided into three treatments um, of web building spiders. We had low abundance, ambient abundance, and high abundance. Um, and to create this, uh, these treatments, we moved all of the spider webs we found in the low treatments into the high treatment plots, or the high abundance plots, I'm sorry. Um, and then we set up these uh, traps and sampled weekly. We're currently going through all of our samples here in Iowa, and that involves um, everything to the lowest taxonomic unit possible and then deriving these community assemblages. Some preliminary data we have from looking at feeding sheet samples we collected on the last week. Um, here we have the number of spiders from the x-axis and um, the arthropod diverse y. And what we're seeing is that as the number of spiders increases, uh, arthropod diversity decreases. 
There's still a lot more information with this and we're doing a lot of processing and um, analyzing. Um, but some future plans we hope to um, achieve are to do the spider manipulation experiment across the islands. Um, and we're also putting together um, an arthropod guide of the Marianas um, with helpers at the University of Guam, as well as a professor from uh, UW Green Bay to help with some spider identification of some of the samples over the summer. And so we're in the very early works of trying to understand what's going on in this black box. But doing so and exploring all of this can um, help us understand um, the effects that bird loss the plant communities um, through the arthropods. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you to these wonderful people and our funding sources. And I look forward to the questions later. Nicely done. Great job, Gerilyn. I'm gonna, I'll call you back for questions, okay? okay. So our next speaker is Bronson Curry, um, who will be telling us about tree snail conservation. Um, Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Bronson Curry. I'm a biologist with the CNMI division, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, tree snails in the Marianas. These are snails in the family Partulidae, uh, which is a widely distributed family of, of snails across. We have multiple species in these islands, and the Marianas represent the northwesternmost distribution of the family across the Pacific. Um, in the interest of time, I'm probably going to slide pretty quickly, but I'll try to summarize on the fly. Um, I know that you've seen this already. Uh, I'll just say that there are eight islands in the CNMI as well as Guam that have parnels. And uh, again, this is uh, a, a family that's fairly widely distributed, but this is the northern extent of their distribution. Um, I need to go through all the detailed history, but uh, to summarize this, I would just say that even though land use regimes have changed over time, what's been consistent is uh, native limestone forest habitat. And this is significant for snails because this is a, they do not thrive outside of the native forest communities and they find it colonized areas that have been cut in the past. So the continuing loss of native forest is a, is a serious conservation concern for them. And of course that's, you know, a long time ago and has accelerated as we reach the modern age, culminating in really catastrophic losses of forest during World War II, primarily as a result of wartime activity. And that kind of brings us to the most immediate and proximate threat which are multiple introductions of non-native species uh, that have impacted these. So early in the 20th century, we saw an introduction of uh, African giant snail, Acatina fulica, that became crop pests. And in the 1970s, um, there was a deliberate introduction of a couple of other species of snails that prey on other snails to control these pests, Gonaxis kibwesiensis and Euglandina rosea among them. And Euglandina especially has been a, become a, quite a, a pest, a nuisance species across many Pacific islands and has decimated snail fauna throughout the Pacific. Um, and a little bit later on, a new player enters the game. That's Platydemus maniquari, the New Guinea flatworm, which is a uh, mollusk that preys on a variety of snails, including Gonaxis and Euglandina. Uh, in recent years, we have not seen any live specimens of Gonaxis or Euglandina. It's, it, it may well be that the introduction of Platydemus has led to a virtual eradication of these species, um, but it's also led to uh, considerable damage to the native snails as well. And we do still have Acatina present in our islands. You can see them almost everywhere. And in fact, when you see uh, hermit crabs, video of the aga uh, getting the hermit crab out of its shell, they really like those uh, African giant snail shells. So uh, that kind of brings us to today, where we have uh, limited habitat and we have in, uh, constant pressure on the species in, in terms of in, uh, introduced predators. There are four species in the sea considered to be of management interest. Uh, Partula gibba, the humped tree snail, is the most widespread. This is found on Guam, uh, it's found on Tinian and Saipan, and also for the northern islands. Uh, we also have Partula langfordi, Langford's tree snail, 
which were present on a gig one and uh, repeated surveys in the last 20 years have failed to turn it up. So we consider it to be likely extinct, but species that we uh, uh, consider part of the CNMI snail partulid fauna. And uh, we have a partulid species on Rhoda that was formerly uh, synonymous with P. gibba. Um, some genetic work has suggested that it needs to be elevated to uh, a species status on its own, but um, we're awaiting that. And then uh, Samoana fragilis is found on Rhoda in Guam. This is the fragile tree snail, uh, and it's uh, currently only found on one site on Rhoda. And um, all of these are federally endangered species, with the exception of the Rhoda partulid, because it's it's not considered uh, officially to be elevated to species status. And because Guam isn't here to represent their snails, I just threw a couple others up on there. Um, I should have highlighted Partula gibba. So Guam has Partula gibba as well, and it has Samoana fragilis and Partula radiolata, which I think is the Guam tree snail. And those are all listed species as well. Um, so here's Partula gibba and the Rota partulid, which are very similar looking. Um, again, we have Partula gibba on Saipan and Tinian, and the Rota partulid on, on Rota only. These are all specimens that were photographed within the last few years. Uh, Partula langfordi is found on a Giguan. Um, we only have, again, very old historical records for this species. And Samoana fragilis is found on Rhoda alone. Uh, they're also very similar looking with a bit of shell that, that marks them uh, di fairly distinctively from the Partula Rhoda. So um, I'll go by, sorry about that, I'll go through uh, island species by species treatment. And I'll try to, to go through this really fast so I can stay on time. Um, the most important thing to know about Partula gibba is it's fairly widespread across the um, especially uh, on the northern islands we found healthy populations within the last uh, 10 years on Sarigan and Pagan and uh, the date next to each island is kind of small but that's the date of the last record from each island and it is currently uh, extremely threatened on Saipan and Tinian. I've got a slide here that kind of illustrates this. This is just sort of to drive home the point that um, all four of these sites within the last 10 years of detections, but um, currently, since I've been here at uh, DFW in the last year and a half, we've only found snails at site number four. So Tinny be down from its one site to uh, nothing. We need to continue surveying there. We also need to continue surveying on Saipan. But again, there's been a um, rapid decline in the species, uh, especially since the 90s. And this is uh, very concerning because they aren't on any of the other southern islands. There are populations in the northern islands, but uh, let's see. Uh, I don't really need to run too much. Uh, Partula gibba was found on Anatan, but it may well not be there after the eruption. Uh, we hope to go there in 2020 to do bio inventories, and we'll do a snail survey to find some. Um, there is a relatively uh, healthy population on Sarigan without platydemus, which is a good sign, and uh, without ungulate, uh, it's also a very good thing because they're altering the native habitat in ways that aren't conducive to snail survival. Uh, on Alamagan, um, snails were not seen during the teen bio inventory, but platydemus was located at that time. And uh, pagan were locally abundant in some places. Platydemus were not 2010 survey. Uh, I already kind of mentioned Langford's tree snail. It was only ever known from a gig when there was a fairly extensive search on 2006 that didn't turn. And uh, that brings us to Rhoda. Um, I didn't make a map of locations on Rhoda because it would be a little cluttered, but um, I, I can summarize it by saying that within the last 10 years, well, within the last 20 years, we've had 13 locations that were marked there. Um, I've been able to detect snails at eight of these. Uh, that's for uh, Partula rota, sorry. I'll, I'll get to Samoana. And um, this is a bit of an unusual spot because several are found in beach zones. Um, this is also the site of the coming year's uh, management. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, Samoana fragilis is no, it, it was detected at one point in time at two locations on Rota. Uh, currently, I, I have to find them at one. I do want to add a caveat that because these are arboreal snails that can exist very high in the canopy, um, detection can be very low, so I wouldn't write off any of these as no longer having snails, uh, simply because we haven't been able to find them on a small number of surveys. Um, just to talk about major, uh, this sort of recapitulates some things I already said, but um, the, the, the biggest threat is the 
compounded effect of habitat loss, relatively few populations, and then exacerbated by the invasive predators, particularly platydemus. Um, some of these sites are in locations that are sent potentially uh, vulnerable to human disturbance, um, including uh, a municipal pipeline on Rota that provides most of the island's drinking water. Um, there are also unknown like rat predation and ungulate browsing on, on Rota deer uh, alter the native forest in ways that may have a lot of impacts on snails and I'm sure some of the reforestation people can. Um, but uh, one positive sign is that uh, I've not been able to find any Gunaxis or Euglandina, only very old shells. So it may well uh, not the threat they used to be. Um, and this is a photo of Platydemus. So this is a, a flatworm. I, I feel like most of the ones that I see are maybe about or less, but they can get a little bit larger. Um, again, it's, it preys on a variety of snails and um, mostly estivates in leaf litter and then uh, during butter periods and at night to uh, attack snails. And uh, just to mention the current work that we're doing, the project that I'm mostly involved with is, uh, is, is twofold, really. We're, we're trying to collect data on these populations that um, we're very lucky in the sense that uh, a lot of research has been done over the years. Published work dating back to 1925 on uh, partulate snails of the Marianas. But until now, we really haven't had the opportunity to mount a comprehensive snail survey program of our own. So we're uh, beginning that, and we're trying to just uh, quantify populations that we have and uh, look toward 2020 when we'll begin uh, pursuing some direct management. And I think my time is up, so thank you very much for contributed, and thank you. Thank you, Bronson. We're going to move on to our next uh, speed talk, um, Ani Oliveira, who will be, uh, will be staying on Luda and talking about fruit bats. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, just like to thank, uh, I start a little bit backwards and thank Joshua for all the support and friendship in this work, which all of the, or most of the things wouldn't be possible here. Um, and also the part of the movement data is mostly with Josh as well. We are combining with the data from the seed dispersal, but celebration. If you want to ask any more specific details about all the movement things, Joshua is the guy. <laughs> um, so talking about him and fruit bats, they're uh, widespread across the, the paleotropics, so Oceania, uh, Africa and a little bit in, in, in Asia as well. The distance, they're, good seed, they're considered to be, in most cases, good seed dispersals. Um, but uh, they're also, which is something very interesting. So most, a lot of species of fruit bats, they only happen in islands. They're highly threatened, as is the case of the Mariana fruit bats or the Fanihi, uh, which is a species that occurs uh, across many of the Mariana Islands. And it's estimated to be in a few thousand individuals now. But Sophie knows very well the role of these species on the sea dispersal across the Mariana Islands. And just one study has been done on the movement ecology of this. They, they are known by uh, feeding on at least 40 uh, plant species, but it's likely they feed much more species than this. This is a short list of the native species from the Mariana Islands that they are known to feed on. But uh, the questions that we focus on, these all results, we're still putting all together the data. I just came back from the field to the conference to, to start, like, to be able to present here. So which uh, fruits do Mariana fruit on their diet and potentially disperse? And also, can Mariana fruit bats be effective seed dispersers on the Mariana Islands? So we went out in the field, uh, always with the help of, of Josh or people from the CNMI, from the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, we set high canopy uh, nets because these bats fly very high. They're quite a bit difficult to capture on the mist nets. Then uh, Joshua put the, the, the radio tags on. And we also, before putting the radio tags, we kept them in, in, um, we kept them in the feeding cage. We fed them the fruits that, uh, that we want to, to be on their the, on the diet. Then we pick the fruits from the diets and we plant them in the nursery together with the fruits that are all selected from the wild. So we could compare the germination rates between the, and analyze the effect of the marina fruit bat on the germination rates of the plant species on the Mariana Islands, on the rota more specifically. Everything that we'll be talking here will be about rota. That's most of our, ba our work we're based on. And also the, the of individuals of the marina fruit bat are actually located. 
In addition, we also put some camera traps out to try to see if we can capture any feeding behavior with bats on any of the plant species that we, we ha they have on the list. They have been listed to be fed on. So this will be, part you'll be like talking a little bit more about it, this. So these are the movements of uh, two males during three nights. And you can see that they, of the, the way that they move in the landscape can change a little bit. Uh, this is uh, just after the typhoon on the left, and after the uh, 10 months after on the right, but Josh will talk a little bit more on his talk, and you can ask more details about him for the movement, like ecology. Uh, we are used to combine the, the movements of the bats with the seed dispersion, so you can see a little bit here that they move across the landscape pretty well, like covering large distance, and the idea was to uh, mix this with the gut retention times, so you can see that they can retain the seeds of small seeds of some species for quite, which can uh, potentially include then as good seed dispersers for large distance across the landscape. Uh, also some uh, of the photos of the way that they handle the, the fruits. So you can see they can eat partially or have almost no effect on the, at least on the fruits, at least that's what I have seen in captivity. And some fruits, they seem to be much more, much more on them, spend much more time handling the fruits. And also you can see some of them that have been gut pests. So some fruits are too, too big for them to be ingesting. So it's possible that they might be carrying these fruits away from the mother tree. But we're not sure how this actually works. But small seeds, especially on the top left, they can be dispersing the seeds across the landscape. Uh, so, unfortunately, we're not able to cap. They didn't seem to be feeding on the fruits that we put the camera traps on, which covered this uh, a height from zero to four meters high, uh, spending uh, almost 100 days of uh, camera trapping. But our field observations, we could mainly see that they uh, seem to have a good preference for bread fruits. So, what we've seen the wise is that they love bread fruits and pandanus. And every time there is something uh, fruiting of these three species, they usually go for it. So, but we were able to see a range of other species visiting the plant species that were uh, using the camera traps, such as the Arlene, the Sully, the Micronesian honey eater, the Ejeje, I hope I'm, doing, I'm saying it right, and the, uh, the Rodents as well. It seems to be some of the main uh, frugivores on the island, according to the camera trap data. So the conclusion is that bread fruits uh, and kafu, they seem to be most some of the most important items in the diets of the bats. Maria fruit bats seem to be potentially good seed dispersers in the environment, in the, in the keep, especially for uh, small seeds. Uh, they have uh, different uh, ways that they can handle the fruits. And also they, uh, oh, they have different dispersal capabilities of the, the fruit species that they, they, they have on their diets, and they can handle the fruits in quite different ways. To do this talk here without the support and help of all this team of uh, amazing people, especially with the support of Haldry, Makila, and you one as well, who was a before my <laughs> grumpiness <laughs> like on the field and all the hard work that he has put during the time there. Thank you, everybody. We're going to stick on the topic of seed dispersal for our next presenter in the last lunch. Um, this is Martin Kastner, who will be uh, telling us all about fruit islands and explaining what that means. All right, um, half a day, everyone. I'm Martin. I've been uh, working with Sali quite a few years now. And this project is just a little side project based on an observation that I made of these clusters of four trees just growing among the lawn on Anderson Air Force Base. And so I'll um, just back up a little bit and talk about some of the context. So across the globe, unfortunately, animal populations are decreasing. And particularly on Guam, we've lost a lot of forgivorous birds, solidly species that remain in any population. And they're restricted to small kind of micro populations of a few, a few individuals in urban areas, but larger but still quite small population on Anderson Air Force Base. And um, from a functional perspective, a lot to reach functional extinction before they reach actual extinction. And so with a Sali, it wasn't really known whether 
um, they had an ecological function on Guam, and uh, some papers have assumed that probably the function is entirely gone. So the question is whether Sali can still be an ecological function within their range, and also whether seed dispersals are actually important. Are, on one hand, can these birds be actual dispersal, or otherwise, are the seeds going to get there one way or another, just stochastically? Um, so Henry went into this a little bit in his, but Sali are incredible dispersers, you know, across all of Micronesia, and they have long distance movements of several kilometers, um, on especially the juveniles on Guam, as Henry pointed out. They range really far all over Anderson. This is, I mean, a, one example, but they go quite a bit further. Have incredibly broad diets. We've documented almost 40 species within their diet, and there are probably more. It's essentially, all of the fleshy fruit seeds on Guam, with a few exceptions. They also have a pretty positive impact on germination overall. And finally, um, they cross ecotones. And so what's that mean? what that means is that they go between habitats. They're generalists. And so they'll go from native areas to degraded areas, vice versa, and different habitats. So all in all, they're pretty amazing birds. Um, so the study that we did is on two military housing areas in northern Guam that are quite similar. They're large areas essentially of lawn with a few isolated, mostly some other ornamental trees. And um, some of the housing on both areas is partly demolished. Um, a lot of you have spent quite a bit of time in these areas, look like. But they're similar size, and importantly, the landscaping on both areas is similar. It's done by the same company with the same equipment, just a mowing and bush cutting right up against the trees. Um, and so what we did is we just numbered all the trees of both areas. We selected 100 uh, seedlings and saplings within a meter of those 100 trees in both areas. Super, super simple design. What we found was that in areas without Sali, we found a couple of native and a couple of introduced species. Well, Whereas in Italy, we found eight native species and three introduced. In terms of seedlings, um, larger difference, we found five introduced seedlings in the areas without Sali. In the areas with Sali, 400 native seedlings, 173 introduced. So mixed native species. Um, so just a quick idea of kind of how these fruit islands come about. The Sali perch and roost in over and they um, defecate below the trees, also below their boxes, also kind of all over the place. And so we get um, some growing around, especially below these like perch and roost trees, and then they keep growing, then a whole bunch of mowing just goes on, and eventually you end up with something that looks like what's on the bottom right, which is just kind of like a little mini forest growing in an otherwise kind of pretty bleak landscape. So we end up with a, call, a whole bunch of interesting species. We got Amit, Melanolepis, uh, sorry, Alum, um, Agau, um, Pipteris, and growing kind of right out of the side of a Casarina as if it's a karst boulder. And um, we even found a uh, listed species, Tabernay Montana, growing in this area lawn. Uh, they ended up putting up a little sign for it, which is kind of cool. And then there's all kinds of Nunu and um, all over the place. So it's pretty interesting to find these um, kind of little clusters of trees. And so, I mean, in terms of now, where do we go from here? So, as I said, they mostly disperse native species, but also non-native. Coccinia ivy gourd is a big problem here in Saipan, as a lot of you know. And so it'll be important to keep kind of managing these species, especially as a hopefully recover with increased snake control. And I mean, it's not, especially in these areas, it's not the hardest thing in the world. You just cut those big vines, and that'll take out some big fruit. So that'll be super important going forward. We did some transects within areas with Sali and without Sali on Guam, and um, big difference within the forest in terms of the number of seedlings. And so it's likely that the deer are just mowing down all the seedlings within the forest as they do all over. So deer also important. But really, I mean, Sali are obviously incredibly important ecologically, and so their restoration have a powerful effects in terms of rewilding, which in the sense of restoring a species for the restoration of function. And we didn't see re regeneration of plants at all where Sali are absent, 
but even where they, within their small population, I understand they're obviously having a really um, important effect. Um, let's spread Sali. Um, and so you could get areas like this with Tongan and Tongan and overstory and a whole bunch of native seedlings that's on um, Anderson Air Force Base. So thanks to the field and all the partners, and that's it for me. All right, I'm going to ask the speakers to come up and we can um, do questions for a few minutes. I'll bring uh, um, Geraldine back on here as well. Um, and we'll have some announcements and break for lunch. First of all, uh, Martin, awesome, like really elegant there, uh, super clear results. I was wondering if you looked at the um, the identity of sort of that property or, or whatever was giving the structure, the overstory structure, uh, to allow those food islands to um, a primary, primarily introduce trees or native trees or um, yeah, how they might have come about. Um, yeah, great question, and um, we did look at it a little bit, um, and they're, I mean, they're mostly the same kind of regular suspects, so Cassarina, Caliphylum, and um, there wasn't a big difference in terms of, uh, like, no significant difference in terms of the overstory tree, but larger the kind of more little nooks and crannies there are for seedlings to grow, so that did have a difference. Geraldine, the girl that's, uh, yeah, Geraldine. Um, on that slide you had with the spiders, where you took, oh, fantastic design by the way, Bruin, you had 15 um, at the very extend, uh, at the extreme, that's kind of adjusting or pulling down on the regression, analyzing it without that uh, outlier? Yeah, so um, I, ha I have tried, uh, I was looking at um, graphics and also um, recognizing that uh, um, these uh, treatments were driven by, so we had uh, three replicates, let's uh, see some background on um, what we did. We had um, three replicates of these, and um, so the spider abundances seem to be dependent, or um, our treatments are dependent upon like re the relative abundance. Um, and so we, I had tried also to look at um, the, um, looking at specifically these plots, uh, there's not really a strong correlation um, because in some of our plots, we actually also see this like, uh, we see like a positive and a negative, but three points are driving these lines, really. Um, and so, which is why I've, I've uh, kind of mentioned that I refined some of our methods um, um, to uh, control or to get better at um, kind of these um, spider abundances to match our treatments, if that makes sense.
Um, so I think the question was uh, just to restate for everyone uh, the multi the multitude of issues that we're facing for restoration of native ecosystems and whether all those processes need to be addressed simultaneously can be done in a more piecemeal fashion. Is that kind of what, what you were saying? Um, I can speak a little bit to the snail program because I uh, talk about this too much during the slides, but we are uh, implementing direct management in 2020 and that will include rat trapping and ungulate exclusion because they can definitely do that we know have, uh, are likely to have a positive impact on the species and on those habitats, probably a multitude of species, and are unlikely to have it. Um, if there are ways that we could address all of those issues at once, that would be great. Um, I don't have, I, I wish that I knew what that would be, but if, if some other idea of how we can, uh, yeah, I, I think that the, maybe the most important thing is to focus on the holistic benefit of, of all of those uh, Indians and <laughs> hope that, uh, um, my, maybe my communication with different folks and different research programs, we can maximize the benefit of any one uh, program or treatment. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I think great question, one for sure. But um, I think really, I mean, from my personal point of view, anything is better than nothing. And so, you know, control of ungulates is better than no control. Eradication would be ideal. It, I mean, there are obviously some situations where a certain order is required. I think I almost included in my talk, but talking about reintroduction or order, I think for birds, you need to keep in mind kind of their role, of their, um, whether they're predators, seed dispersers, that kind of thing. But um, be beyond that, I mean, I think, you know, for snails, bats, I mean, just, you know, any kind of management is helpful. And so everyone's efforts out here are pretty amazing. From my side, Josh's talk is going to be a little about the, the list in the funny, like the marine fruit bats. So I think it's better to, to get all the, but I think for, from the four months that I spent in the island, seems to be mostly poaching and uh, giving enough habitat for the bats. Yeah. All right, let's give uh, this uh, speed talk crew a round of applause. Thank you, guys. I'm going to turn it over to Jill for some announcements, and then uh, she'll let you know uh, about lunch. And then we are going to meet back after lunch at 1.15. So, 1.15. All right. Thanks, everyone. Hey, great morning so far. I'm looking forward to this afternoon. Uh, before I give you the lunch logistics, I just want to take this opportunity now to, to do some thank yous for the, the organizations and the people conference possible. Um, the, the, you know, the TV folks just asked me, well, who's sponsoring this conference? And I'm like, um, well, it doesn't anybody. <laughs> but, but the fact is it, it it doesn't belong to any one organization. It really is a coalition of agencies and businesses and individuals that are all volunteering their time and energy to put this on. Um, but first off, there, there was there is no money for this conference, you know, and so um, probably a biggest thank you needs to go to the University of Guam and the Western Pacific Tropical Reform. Um, the, the donation that made us having this room and that coffee in the corner possible. Um, so huge thank you, OG. They've been a great sponsor of this conference, not just this year, but the past couple years on Guam. And uh, it made my job so much more. I don't know how, how I would have paid for this room otherwise. So thank you to them. Thank you. Uh, the wonderful pastries donated by Herman's Bakery, much appreciated. Uh, thank you to the folks from the Marianas High School Production Show who are doing all this fantastic recording and they are live streaming it and it is going to be, um, these presentations are all going to go site later. So thank you for being here today and thank you to Micronesian Environmental Services for sponsoring the MHS Production Clubs today. Uh, 
and uh, the field trips. Uh, we've got Division of Fish and Wildlife, Division of Coastal Resources Management, uh, Ecology of Bird Loss, U.S. Geological Survey, all folks that are sponsoring field trips.